um, the basics of IV nutrient therapy. So recently the rise of drip bars in IV hydration stations are seen. Um, purpose of these treatments are usually for hangovers, dehydration, or for somebody who's having the flu, overexertion, food poisoning, jet lags, uh, even getting an instant healthy glow for skin and hair. Uh, even endorsed by celebrities like Kim Kardashian, Simon Cowell, and Rihanna, who doesn't know them, right? Well, let's dig deeper on what is the secret of IV therapy that everyone wants to get. Uh, it's a very broad topic. The thing here is I want to focus on the most common uh, vitamin, um, I guess, multivitamin mineral drip that we always hear about and not on the other IV therapies around, but this is the one that kind of is being sold out in the market. They may name it the jet lag drip, beauty and skin, immune booster and anti-fatigue. Yes, I've also heard weird names like the knockout punch, the waker upper, the big uppercut. They're sounding like wrestler names. But the concept is that they are all just multivitamin mineral IV drips with various mixtures and dosings that defines their effects. Here are my credentials. Before I start, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Bill again for this invite. My mentors, Dr. Cora, Dr. Forsyth, Majid, my bio-integrative staff, um, especially Lucy and Carrie, my left and right arm uh, here in the office, uh, and also the, our staff, the patients that we work for every day, our audience, especially for your time, and most important of all, the one above who gave us this healing hands to treat. So when I started, uh, I really don't know where to specialize. There's so much things in integrative medicine to, to dip your hands in. Supplements, acupuncture, energy medicine. The one thing that I saw here in our practice are the IV therapies that we're giving here. The reason why I got curious about it is because of the fast results and also 100% delivery compared to oral supplementation. The thing here is there's great risk, also great reward. The slightest dosing error could cause harm instantly to a patient. And how I started, I needed to know how it feels. So I tried every IV, every IM injection in my clinic, and I became my own guinea pig. Uh, this is how I look like after from a brown skin Asian boy, well, leading to the effects of the medicine turned me into this band, bandaged up white dude. No, I'm kidding. But it's just me describing how extreme my passion is in relation to IV therapy. So our presentation not only applies to practitioners of IV therapies, but also for patient, or for practitioners who does IM injections also. And I'll, sometimes the dosing, you will see on the studies here, some dosings will apply for IV and IM. They might be similar. And also this can be added to your own practice. <clears throat> and hopefully that will be, uh, I can impart some of that for you. And, and so here's where it all started. The Myers cocktail. This is the original doctored by Dr. John Myers, not the singer. He's a physician in Maryland uh, in the 1970s. And he used to treat patients with the conditions of fatigue, migraines, fibromyalgia. And the, the cocktail is, as you can see here, the ingredients is in the form of just micronutrient therapy. And the terms Myers cocktail didn't come into fruition after his death in 1984. As you can see, you would think that, huh, maybe these disease conditions were just related to these deficiencies of these minerals and vitamins. But now, as we see the evolution of the Myers cocktail, uh, the different names that I just mentioned to you are just different dosings. They added different ingredients to it. But the heart of, of multi-mineral uh, vitamin therapy is this. So there are two components of, again, this, this so-called IV therapy that I'm mentioning. Number one, vitamins. And you would see here, it's uh, vitamins is defined as organic compounds. We need it in small amounts for metabolic reactions in our body. Some are synthesi uh, synthesized in our bodies, but not enough for our needs. A good example would be tryptophan, which also turns into niacin. And also we can get this from food supplements or injectables. The other part of that are the minerals elements needed by our bodies, like potassium, magnesium, chromium, calcium. And most of these are actually uh, positive ions and are in the forms of salts, like potassium chloride. Uh, here's, a, here's a sample of the, um, of the infusion. <clears throat> and these are the common vitamins that we use. And it varies for different practitioners. I just want to emphasize here that we do use methylated forms for the reason that almost 50% of our population has the MTHFR gene deletion. So the methylcobalamin, uh, methylfolate, 
are the ones that I'm emphasizing on. And here are the most common minerals that we also use in our concoction. So the thing here is, it's really hard to overdose on, on these specific IVs. I mean, it can happen, but very hard because number one, majority of your components are what we call um, water soluble, which are excreted in the urine. And if you do have side effects, usually nausea, if it's rapidly infused, and even and if given in higher doses, phlebitis can happen, of course, but nausea is the, I guess, the, the, the standout. And if you think that, hey, how about the fat solubles? Yes, we also can give that, but it's not really common, as you can see. And it's, it's very hard to give these fat soluble ones, like the attic fat soluble vitamins, but it's still possible though. So this is what you need to watch out for. And I'm sure some of the practitioners here has an IV room. The patients who are actually playing around with their rollers and th these rollers really starts from the above. And then at the end of the infusion, you'll see them below at the patient level because they're playing around with it and they just wanna speed things up and get out. And this is what they get. They get nauseated, they get sick. So watch out for these guys. So just to give you a heads up, some journals, uh, I guess, in terms of discussing the importance of vitamin and nutrient therapy, uh, usually are still low on the count. And majority are still gonna be, of course, orals, but majority of what you're gonna see here would be um, the IV and the IM routes, but you will see also orals. Just wanna give you a heads up. But um, again, just covering both, um, I guess, all these aspects in terms of administration. Let's start with thiamine, B1. B1 is coenzyme in oxidative decarboxylation, meaning the removal of the carboxylate group and thus forming CO2. And it's used for carbohydrate metabolism for energy. And when you buy it in vials, it's usually 100 milligrams per mil. So it can be given IM or IV. And out of all the Bs, this is the one that I kind of give want to give you guys heads up about, because this is the one that actually will cause rare, rare allergic reactions. And then when you talk about rare allergic reactions, it's really more of sensitivity. People just get a little flushed. I mean, sure, rashes, but it's not really leading to that scary point of anaphylaxis, but it can still do. So just giving you a heads up. And high doses, uh, usually no association with toxicity. And if you are in suspect for this, for a patient, do a skin test. That will definitely answer that question for you. So for the use of thiamine, you would uh, see on, on, the, on the first rung, would be for alcoholics, any alcoholic patient you have, think about thiamine def uh, deficiency, especially the ones who's manifesting Wernicke's Korsakoff. And this is also what we call encephalopathy in terms of alcoholic intake, manifesting impaired gait, memory and vision, and refined, refined grains and beans, it loses all the thiamine already. So people who eat a lot of this are probably thiamine deficient. Berry, berry, wet and dry, wet is cardiac and dry is um, neurological. That's the obvious uh, B1 deficiency condition or disease that's affiliated with this. And here's the one that I use it clinically. For my Parkinson's patients, I use this specific study to cite 100 milligrams of thiamine IM two times a week without any change to their personal therapy, meaning they can still be using their levodopa, carbidopa. And still, you will be getting a good result with your patients. I mean, it's a hit and miss for me. I might give you maybe a 60%, uh, but still it's worth a try for Parkinson's patients, especially if you don't have an IV infusion room, you can do this IM. So these guys are, were, or the, these samples were evaluated after one month to three months during therapy and thus improvement was still seen. So for B2 riboflavin, <clears throat> this is part of usually a B complex when you buy it in a, in a vial. And it's usually uh, related to the increase in absorption of iron and zinc. And it's also supporting the FMN um, enzyme. This is used in relation to converting B6 to uh, coenzyme pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And if we have NAD, we also have FAD. So this is also used for energy production, cellular functioning, growth and development, metabolism of fats, drugs, and steroids, and also needed to convert tryptophan to niacin, and also maintains normal levels of homocysteine. So you will see that here in um, the diagram. So you would see the methionine cycle here, more on the left side, you would see it's related to MTHF side of the graph that helps convert uh, homocysteine into methionine. B2, well, we always have this thought of the most famous antioxidants are mostly vitamin C. We have vitamin E, 
Um, <clears throat> but the thing here, riboflavin is also another antioxidant. It's independent or uh, in also part of the glutathione redox cycle. So this study showed that the protective um, uh, capacities of B12 from oxidative stress, especially lipid peroxidation and reperfusion oxidative injury. And here it is. So you would see here also that um, uh, this is where the, the cycling of the, uh, the glutathione occurs and how essential our riboflavin is. And it's the one that um, makes the oxidized glutathione recycle into a reduced uh, form. And here's another study uh, shows that so when we're thinking about, oh, it's only magnesium, progesterone, tryptan that would help with, uh, with migraine headaches. Riboflavin also has a place for this specific condition. So 400 milligrams a day. So this is a study that was actually given, uh, done as a, in, in, in the oral form. But again, this is something that you can now add in your arsenal to actually try to address migraine headaches. B3 niacinamide this is the final conversion of niacin. So niacin turns into this. And you would see this usually in the B complex and dose as 100 milligrams per mil. If you're low in B3, usually you will see hypercholesterolemia and cardiovascular disease. And again, niacin is the one that's known for flushing. Niacinamide, not much. And this is this, these are the one, these are the the, the, the vitamins that kind of has lower studies related to IV and IM. So that's why I just want to show you here that it's pretty good in terms of the dermatological um, aspect of therapy that it increases ceramide and free fatty acids levels in the skin and prevents skin from losing water content and even stimulate circulation for the dermis. And here's another one. We all know the power of NAD. And this is also another oral study. But as we, as I said, niacin uh, and niacinamide are all related to the formation of NAD. But everybody knows the, the power and capacity of, of niacin. Now, I just want to show you how it interacts with NAD. So B5, it's uh, the concentration in the market. It's 250 milligrams per mil in a vial. And this is the alcohol form of pentothenic acid. It builds, it breaks down carbohydrates, fats, builds steroids, hormones, and hemoglobin. Uh, in IM doses, you can have this range as, uh, to be given to a patient, 250 to 500 milligrams. And if you have the convenience of the IV access, 250 milligrams and diluted. And I mean, it's an IV push. But when in a drip, you can actually go as high as 500 milligrams. So for IM, I always go low. When I have the access of a drip, I always go higher because I have that convenience of putting more in a bag and not causing pain to the, uh, to the patient during infusion. Again, another uh, vitamin that has a little lower uh, on the number of um, IVIM um, studies. And here you would see that it's actually better than an actual uh, antihistamine decongestant if you're using the expanthenol as uh, a decongest in decongestant form. D6 pyridoxine concentration in the market, 100 milligrams per mil, and also used as a coenzyme in carbohydrates, protein, and fat metabolism. Deficiencies are usually found in can uh, cancer cases, which is a malignancy, somebody who's on drug therapy. So the majority of this would be yeah, the statins, the, the more um, uh, corrosive and strong cardiovascular medications malabsorption syndromes, and even alcohol intake. If undiluted given IV, so you have to be, I've seen this before when I gave it, that it can actually uh, produce dizziness, fainting, and even irritation of the vein. So just be careful when you're, when you're giving this. And caution on Parkinson's. Anything greater than five milligrams daily reverses effects of levodopa on peripheral tissues. And again, less on, on cinnamon. As we all know, um, carbidopa acts on uh, dopamine decarboxylase. So this neutralizes that enzyme when you go higher than five milligrams. So just be cautious with your um, Parkinson's patients. And here you would also see how uh, B6 helps lowers down homocysteine. So you would see that arrow um, going down to cystothione and then also turning into cysteine as the final product. And here's another one. So Dr. Bill kind of emphasized this before in relation to uh, the semaglutide uh, concoction with BPC and B6. So you can see in this study, 80 milligrams per day, first trimester of nausea, uh, the nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, 
uh, when you use pyridoxine for four days, produced good results in controlling the specific symptom. Again, this is an oral study. So in my experience clinically, I have done it as an IV or as a or more of an IV push, but that's something that we do not recommend, especially for the non-experienced. And also have consents when you're talking about Again, first trimester, this is where the, um, the kind of you draw the line in terms of putting yourself at risk if something happens to that specific pregnancy. I do not promote this, but I have done it in some way and it did help my patient. And then B-complex. So B-complex is a combination of uh, all the Bs that I just mentioned, thiamine, riboflavin, niacinamide, expanthenol, and pyridoxine. <clears throat> and this is usually uh, in, in 100 mil. Uh, uh, vial as well. And I am, I suggest you can give it in one mil. If you go up to two mils, now you probably should think about more of an IV push, diluted IV push, or even IV uh, infusion or IV drip. It's always parts of the, part of the Myers cocktail, as we always hear. Usually no, no adverse effect when you infuse this. But again, this is one of the, the, the components that can actually cause nausea if rapidly infused. And in relation to, to that, the, the thing here is for B-complex, the studies are not really that much again. Again, in relation to now and pertaining to human subjects, but the ones who really, really need to kind of thank for the studies for the B-complex are the rats. So again, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges, but again, something that we can bank on in terms of theoretical application. So do you ever think what... Uh, the rats are kind of thinking of when they're seeing us experimenting on them. Do you ever think they have a clue? So they believe in conspiracy theories as well. So maybe they know, maybe not. The B-complex study that I'm pertaining to here is related to hyperalgesia. So this is when the rats actually got their uh, infraorbital nerve uh, damage, and they try to find how it can be, uh, again, uh, be treated, especially the hyperalgesia effects. So as you can see here, the combination therapy of B1, B6, and B12 was more effective than the, just the carbamazepine alone or the B12 alone. And here also <clears throat> in relation to the study of neuropathic pain, so this one, uh, as you can see here, that B1, B6, B12 daily for seven to nine days actually helped the allodynia. It improved sensory conduction and not effective if given as individual treatment. So just my point here is the B-complex in combination brings a lot to the table versus just giving B1, B6, B12 in a separate manner. And now going to uh, the famous B12 family, the cobalamins, so cyanocobalamin, uh, this is something that we always hear. It's the most common one in the market and the cheapest one. It's common given the IM and it's uh, commonly, uh, uh, I guess, metabolized by, by the kidney. And the thing here is, well, you, we always hear about the cyanide when it gets metabolized. So that's also one thing that we need to keep an eye on. Second, the hydroxycobalamin, which is the long acting one. Why is it long acting? Because it binds so the protein longer than cyano, thus it circulates and can be used more uh, by the body. So this is available in IM and also in IV form. And third, methylcobalamin. This is the most active form and best used for neurological complaints. So I use this a lot for neuropathy. And uh, yes, IM is the best way uh, to give methyl, but also I have done it through IV therapies as well, but it's just fast acting if you do that. So uh, IM, I think is the best way to suggest on how to administer that. So this converts homocysteine to methionine, as you saw the cycles a while ago, the methionine cycle. And for the methyl specifically, uh, myelin sheath integrity is its focus. And 1000 micrograms is a common dose for that. So do we go up and uh, are we gonna question if it's uh, safe or not? Yes, it is safe, even if it exceeds the daily requirements. So rare reactions we, we, see, uh, we don't see much here. If it does, it's probably due to the preservative used by the chosen pharmacy. Here are studies that uh, you can actually see, and this is one that I kind of want to put out there. We're, we're, we're hearing uh, try, and trying to figure out how to treat tinnitus. So this is a double randomized controlled trial 
And you would see here that IM of 2,500 uh, <clears throat> of methylcobalamin one times a week for six months actually gave, um, again, improvement to these specific uh, patients. But here's a caveat though. The responders to B12 uh, in terms of lowering down or improving their tinnitus are the ones who are already deficient to begin with. The question here is, if you're not deficient and you're given B12, would you respond better? Uh, would you still respond? Again, that's not what the studies um, had uh, gave us, but it's worth a shot, right? It's very hard to treat. So, but again, if this is something that I want you to just put in your arsenal, but of course, always check the other reasons why there could be tinnitus, acoustic neuromas, exposure to loud noises, aspirin uses. Uh, so rule out everything before, um, I mean, and in treating tinnitus, but you can still use B12 anytime. And here's a recent study that uh, shows <clears throat> the power of IV therapy <clears throat> versus oral um, dosing in general. We all know this, but you will hear this a lot from our patients. Our patient would say, oh, I'll just take um, oral and even maybe saving a few bucks here and there. But the thing here is, this is a study that will show you that in treating B12 deficiency anemia, uh, the results are way quicker and faster with intravenous uh, B12. <clears throat> and here's another proof, the putting that the hydroxycobalamin or B12 is now being used to actually, well, again, this will be for ICU practitioners, but uh, it has proof that it can actually help with septic shock. And this is a study that uh, the, the subjects receive a single five gram dose of, high, that's very high. That's why it's high dose and it's hydroxycobalamin. And even in a 200 mil uh, solution, it was infused over 15 minutes through a CV, uh, CV, um, central venous catheter. And this actually produced um, the pay, uh, lower plasma levels of hydrogen sulfate and also lower usage or dosing of the vasopressors. So another proof for you that B12 has its use, not only in the clinical or in the outpatient setting, but also in the in-hospital setting. Next would be folic acid. So again, it's available in 55 to 30 milligrams per mil. It um, preferred for the reason that, of course, I mentioned to you the MTHFR issue, it should be in the form of folinic or methylfolic. The problem there is expensive. Uh, I mean, that's my experience. And it's also the short um, half-life or life uh, of, of folic acid. And another problem that I have with this is if I use folic acid, it clogs up my filters. So you usually kind of mix this at the end of the, of the solution. And again, I am, you can give up to 10 milligrams for the megaloblastic anemia, of course, fully deficient patients. I am again, 0.5 to one milligram per day. For IV, you can go as high as 20 milligrams. Uh, again, I mixed it last in your IV because of the, the precipitates. And you always use a filter. I mean, regardless of whether, my, my experience here is any vitamin bath, if you're gonna mix it on your own, use a filter all the time just to protect yourself from all these precipitates. And adverse reactions, it's very low in the OD department. Again, 400 milligrams per day for five months or 10 milligrams for five years it has not produced any um, um, overdosing. Here in, the, in, the, in this folic acid study, you would see that also uh, when, when we talk about uh, folic acid, uh, can, can you give it too much to a patient and can overload a specific organ, an organ? As you can see here, folic acid is difficult for the liver to metabolize because of a specific uh, enzyme that is very prominent that's deficient in us, the DHFR and thus leading to accumulation. So this accumulation can actually, uh, here, as you can see on the bottom, um, it can mask detection of B12 deficiency and has, enhance deterioration of brain function. So be cautious about giving out specific vitamins that has folic acid in it. And that's why we kind of preach that methylated forms are better. And here, another one, um, some of the just the, the cancer studies about folic acid, here are some studies that when you give folic acid to patients, they are small, very small, uh, but again, um, something to keep an eye on, especially in the future, that uh, it actually has affiliation increasing risk of colorectal cancer. 
So again, folic acid, specifically folic acid. And this is where, again, where the folic acid comes into play as an important, uh, playing an important role on how homocysteine turns into methionine. So B12 and folic kind of plays a big role in that. Another recent study about uh, <clears throat> uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate, this is actually something that improves, um, again, the endothelial function uh, of the system. And here you would notice that uh, infusions um, uh, this is, they're not really known for that. You will hear about nitric oxide supplements uh, that will do this nowadays, but now 5-MTHF has beneficial effects on the endothelium, thus increasing nitric oxide. So another recent study for us to, to bank on. But again, expensive. So just be careful of that about in terms of your pocket and budget. Ascorbic acid is another ingredient of this multivitamin therapy, and this is a famous antioxidant. It donates electrons, everybody knows that. Um, and then it's also a cofactor for lysyl and prolohydroxylases to form collagen. So I use a lot of this post-surgery, for example, somebody who got injured. Uh, I use a lot of vitamin C. And we all know when it's deficient, we have scurvy, poor wound healing. <clears throat> and why is this a little kind of stinging or painful when we do as an IV pusher, as an IV in an IV bag, because of the osmolarity, 5.6 milliosmol per mil. And this is a little higher than any, any of the other vitamins that's thus causing discomfort and pain. How do we buffer that? With sodium bicarbonate, 8.4% um, or calcium gluconate, calcium chloride, 10%. This I'm not a big fan of. I'll stick with sodium bicarbonate. And you'll know why in a bit. I'm going to discuss calcium as well. And again, depends on the dose of the vitamin C in relation to the irritation and the pain that the patient can feel. And this is what we kind of know ascorbic acid for. And you would see here that it's a mild chelator. Um, calcium replacement is usually needed. And you mix this in the, in the bag of your vitamin C, one mil of calcium gluconate, or one third mil for 10% calcium chloride every 10 grams of vitamin C. And this is a hexose derivative. Meaning it's, it look, it's uh, yeah, there's a similarity to the molecule of sugar to this, thus inducing insulin. So, so yeah, some, some practitioners measure um, uh, sugars during ascorbic acid, but I do not uh, promote that or even just a baseline because it does go down. It drains out the blood sugar during a vitamin C infusion. And when you talk about the, the grams, 25 to 75 milligrams, that kind of leads to dehydration a lot. So make sure they have a lot of uh, water beside them. Or we put a bigger bag when we infuse vitamin Cs to remedy that hydration uh, that we were kind of worried about because it leads to osmotic diure diureses and also hypoglycemia, as I mentioned a while ago. For the reason that, of course, they, uh, yeah, the hexose um, derivative, it's a monosaccharide containing six carbon atoms. And uh, with high doses, you always want to think about how does it work, especially we use this concept in cancer a lot. The, per uh, the peroxide is getting produced from high dose vitamin C to surge into the intracellular compartments, thus destroying, of course, cancer and viral infected cells. And there is a big, so this is one of the studies that I've seen that the, uh, the people who are actually positive for, for PET scans in terms of the cancer spread responds better due to the higher glute activity. As we all know, glute transporters is how the, the glucose enters the cell. So a big clue for uh, our practitioners out there who's using this in cancer, the ones who has a positive PET scan think of this um, a lot. And you have to remember, PET scan, they use FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose. That's why when you do a, a PET scan, you would see these cancer cells lining up like a Christmas tree because they eat sugar. So that's why I don't know why our oncologists out there are still not preaching about the avoidance of sugar in relation to cancer aggravation. And another interesting study that I saw uh, is actually related to ascorbic acid increasing intercourse frequency and improves mood. And here you would see that, yeah, 3,000 milligrams a day. So this is a brand name, uh, vitamin C, um, Cidibe. And this is actually increasing. Uh, greater penile and vaginal intercourse frequency 
and decreases the Beck depression scores. So it's not only related to sexual enhancement, but also the mood and the psychiatric um, mindset of, of a patient. So this guy, he is on target and he knows what time it is because he took his vitamin C. Now let's go to the mineral. The minerals. For magnesium, magnesium sulfate is available in 500 milligrams per mil or magnesium chloride in 200 milligrams per mil. Sulfate is, I prefer using that uh, because it has a higher effect in patients who has asthma, muscle cramps, migraines. I mean, be careful of the pushes here. I mean, this, these are just standard three mil pushes, but it has to be diluted. And then when you go higher, I would suggest anything higher than 300 mils, I would just go for a drip. Uh, I just don't want to play with that. I had a patient who had tachycardia when I pushed um, magnesium. Good thing uh, she was fine. And as you would notice here, why these specific conditions? Because they're all related to muscle relaxation. So bronchial muscles, the actual musculoskeletal um, tissues of muscle crown, which is the calf area, and migraines. So we have, we have our muscles, the vice grip muscles that causes our migraine headaches. And most are de magnesium deficient. So you wouldn't go wrong giving magnesium to maybe oral, maybe IV therapy, for the reason that our food has been uh, depleted of this magnesium that we all need. And also the beauty of this, it acts as an antihypertensive. It serves as a, a natural calcium um, channel blocker. So you would see this also in this diagram. So, and again, just be careful with hypotension. Usually, yeah, six mils. Uh, just make sure you always have an access just in case this happens because you want to hydrate and replete that patient in terms of, of, of the volume and support them through that. So you would see here magnesium, extracellular, uh, again, prevents um, calcium from getting in contact uh, to that specific receptor. So this is used a lot clinically. And here, another study that um, for IV therapies, that 1,000 milligrams IV magnesium sulfate improves nausea, photophobia, and even uh, phonophobia in migraine attacks. Another study, 2018, people think, oh, we're scared of doing a lot of magnesium in our patients, especially cardiovascular, but here's a study for you, that administration of IV infusion, uh, four grams even, in a 100 mil, I don't promote this, but this is the study, but as you can see how slow it was given, four hours. And it was proven that there's no significant deleterious effects on these specific um, systems. So don't do this. I just want to show you how safe it is if done the right way. Another one is calcium. So this is uh, in preparation of 10% calcium gluconate or chloride, usually 100 milligrams per mil. Uh, in gluconate form, 100 to 2,000 milligrams. Uh, chloride, 100 to 700 milligrams per IV. Infusion rate should not exceed one uh, mil equivalent per minute. And do not give this IM. It should, will cause necroses abs, uh, and even um, abscess. So just be um, cautious of that. So do not add this also in lipid emulsions because it will form non-visible precipitates and it will lead to death. So if you want to avoid a lawsuit, do not mix this with your phospholipoline or alpha lipoic acid. And always store it in room temperature to avoid precipitation. So sometimes we put it in the fridge thinking that it will spoil, but calcium, no, it should stay out. Adverse effects, so a majority of this will be cardiovascular, lower blood pressure and um, heart rate, arrhythmias, tingling sensation, syncope, and okay, you don't like that, cardiac arrest. Um, IV effects, uh, usually nerve conduction, muscle contraction. So people, when I give this as an infusion, they would say, hey, I have a little tingling or, or spasm feel, but it's not as bad, but it's just because calcium is kicking in. And here's another study on how the combo of calcium and magnesium actually lowers the side effect of chemotherapy. So this is specifically pertaining to Folfox, and this is for colon cancer. And the dosing is here. This is given pre and post um, treatment uh, of Folfox. And you would see that it actually is a neuroprotectant against oxaliplatin induced um, side effects. 
Next is selenium. So this, uh, it's a single in single dosing. It's at 40 micrograms per mil. It's usually presented in a multi-element uh, uh, solution or mineral solution in 100 and 200 micrograms per mil. So if you're gonna give it as an MTE through IV, 200 to 800 micrograms mixed with other vitamins also. It's really excreted and um, avoid exposures to, I mean, this specific solution by itself um, to the sun because it will degrade easy. And I uh, forgot MTE, usually the amount, the contents of that would be selenium, copper, chromium, and zinc, other minerals as well. And it's also an antioxidant in nature combines with proteins to produce selenoproteins. This is usually uh, related to the thyroid and immune uh, regulation of the system. And always think of selenium uh, being depleted when you have mercury toxicity. So for those patients who has uh, amalgam fillings, who likes to eat a lot of fish. So this is something that you should think about and ready to, to replace. And also when you have glutathione reactions, People, I, I have experienced this myself. I gave glutathione before and suddenly the patient starts vomiting nonstop. The thing is, I checked the selenium, there it was. It was very low. So if you have, and I, I'm not only pertaining to nausea and vomiting, but any type of reaction with glutathione, you should check this and again, remedy and address the deficiency if there is one. Here you would see how selenium works. It actually is being used to form reduced to oxidize type of glutathione. And this is uh, one, this is an oral study, but um, people kind of go crazy on selenium sometimes. And this is a study in relation to a non-metastatic prostate cancer. So 140 micrograms per day possibly can increase mortality. So just be cautious and just don't go crazy on, on selenium. Next is potassium. So KCL 2-mex uh, uh, per mil is a common preparation. Again, never IM uh, or IV push, uh, IV push it. Uh, again, the very corrosive, and that's why it needs cardiac monitoring most of the time if you will do IV pushing or even in the hospital. Uh, always diluted in the infusion. And it's always used in, in, the, uh, in like Myers and multi-mineral uh, vitamin bags to improve mineral balance and not for repletion. Uh, the dosing usually can be two to five mils and 250 to 500 mils given in one to three hours if you're just gonna give it as the, ma the majority. But again, I wouldn't suggest that, mix it with your, your vitamin, bag, vitamin bag and not to use it as replacement for hypokalemia. Use in high dose vitamin C or in D5W because in, it induces the insulin to move glucose uh, or uh, into the cells uh, when, when, when needed. So I'll show you a diagram to understand this better. So this is how, what happens. When you give potassium, it will stimulate that sodium potassium pump. So that sodium will go out and will activate down the couple transport protein. Thus, sugar and sodium will go back into the cell so now this is you're gonna this is gonna be an issue because your sugar will drop down. That's why it's this is used for um, um, uh, DKAs or high blood sugar issues. So when you use potassium, most of the time have something ready if the patient does go into hypoglycemia. And yeah, if you if you're planning to give this IV push in your ivory room, yes, you're gonna convert that ivory room into a lethal injection chamber. You're gonna toxify that heart real bad. So for chromium, four micrograms per mil and 200 micrograms per mil. And again, available, um, and, and in infusions, I just use two mils of such, so it's a high range. I always go for the lower uh, preparation and always known and famous for controlling diabetes. So that's why it's for insulin resistance and diabetes too. And yeah, small studies here uh, for chromium. Uh, this is just, again, one case that I saw now how it actually lowered down um, uh, the, the, the need for uh, insulin usage and even pressors and steroids. And after chromium through micrograms per hour, uh, sugar normalized and insulin treatment got DC. So again, one of those rare uh, studies and very small. And zinc, zinc chloride and sulfate, five milligrams per mil. Sulfate is better for IV due to better solubility, uh, no greater than 10 milligrams per million infusions. Rare side effects, I don't see much in this. And indications usually low immunity, impaired wound healing, 
impaired smell and taste, depression and fertility. And we use it a lot in, in hair loss and men's health also. Osmolarity, another term for tonicity, the concentration of solute and volume of solution. And this is the computation, the total amount of volume, milliosmoles divided by total amount of fluid volume times a thousand, then you would get the milliosmoles per liter. So ideally you wanna be in the range of 600 to 1200. This will now give you an idea if the whole IV bag will be well tolerated by the patient and be comfortable because it is not gonna cause pain uh, on the vein where the infusion is started on. So yes, if, this is a whole another lecture, but this is nice to know for as people who wants to find out why is my infusion so painful and how can I mix it? Because you add more um, components to that or you lessen that up to meet this specific range. You don't want this in your IV room. You definitely want this. So again, this is something I hope can elevate, elevate everybody's practice. This is the best time as uh, John, Dr. Bill is talking about. It's the best time to come together. And I hope I imparted some tips for you to improve yours. And let's make the world know about integrative medicine and how much good it can bring for us um, now and in the future. Again, for questions, comments, and feedback, um, please email me. And uh, anytime if you have questions, I'm always available. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um... So how does sublingual methocobalamin compare with oral and IM? Uh, it's really more of the faster absorption of that. When you talk about sublingual, you're talking about, again, uh, down the um, uh, same concept for your, um, your nitroglycerin, right? Fast acting because of the blood vessels that are under your tongue. And when you talk about oral, you, you have to think about gastroparesis, dysbiosis, so that's why absorption is, is kind of slower than sublingual. Uh, do you have any opinion about there's a, a connection between B vitamins and cancers? Uh, I think that came from the theory of methylation. So you can actually over methylate a patient and in relation to now stimulating the, the methylation pathways of cancer cells. So that's why uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, all the practitioners out there have heard that don't just shotgun everybody with, with methylated vitamins. They always want you to get levels. They always want you to find out the gene um, deletion because um, I, I, ju I just recently found out about this really in relation to heterozygous and homozygous MTHFR deletion, dosing variation um, is needed. Uh, well, meaning more of the, the homozygous needs more and the hetero less needs less. But I, th I think that's where the theory comes from. Um, and I do agree with that. Not everybody needs methylated vitamins. And that's why we should check because I, 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 do, I do check for my patients for MTHFR genes. But the thing here is majority really has deletions. Majority of them are hetero. Uh, rarely, I only seen like five uh, that are, there are no deletions. That's why I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, 50% of the population actually has the gene deletion. So it's a flip of a coin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, what about, so we've, we've heard that uh, to, with glutathione should not be mixed with vitamin C. So. Right. Um, in relation to that, Yes, I, I agree with that, but you have to look at this in, in two perspectives. So when you talk about uh, vitamin C, high dose vitamin C to be more specific, uh, now you give, we define this as greater than 50 grams. Some other practitioners defines this as more than 20 grams, but I think that's where it comes from, that when you're giving high dose vitamin C or vitamin C that actually is producing more pro-oxidative reactions, when you introduce glutathione after, which is an antioxidant, now it neutralizes the effects of, of this high-dose vitamin C that you're, you're giving. And most of the time it's encountered in cancer, for example. You don't wanna negate that uh, just because you want that peroxide uh, radical to really do its action in the intracellular matrix of that cancer cell. So that's why for me, I don't do it. I only give glutathione uh, with Myers cocktail, which usually are less, what? Uh, I just do two mils. It is, it's not even close to 20 grams. So five grams, maybe uh, I add my glutathione in there. But when I treat cancer, 
definitely um, just high dose vitamin C is my go-to by itself. Are you using this therapy is during chemotherapy or after? Um, I usually, well, you're talking about glutathione or by high dose all, vitamins? All of that, the oxidant minerals and vitamins. Do you use them uh, IV during chemotherapy or after? Uh, usually after, just because we want to promote the pro-oxidative effect of, of chemotherapy. Yeah, I mean, it does not interfere. The other reason is that those antioxidant minerals and IV, they may um, counteract the, the, the chemotherapy effect. Right. right. That is correct. Okay. Is there a connection between ALA and thyroid issues? Uh, yes. So with um, uh, ALA, the thing here is I, I think I can vouch for high dosing of ALA. I just don't know on top of my head, if you give ALA in higher doses in, for a chronic period of time, you can shut down the, the thyroid. I have seen this in a patient that was treated for hepatitis B or C, and they were on prolonged um, alpha lipoic acid therapy, and this is oral, not even IV, that it actually reverted, reverted the hepatitis, but it shut the thyroid down. So it's really more of chronicity, and the dosing of, of the alpha lipoic acid. I have to get back to you on that in terms of what dose that is. Okay. Do you see shrinking of the tumor or what is there? What is the efficacy I get? Do you have cases where you eliminate the cancer or you just more or less optimizing the health of the chemotherapy? But did you notice any shrinking of the tumor with ultrasound? Uh, with, um, with plain um, high dose vitamin C, I can only give you a few cases that I can count with my fingers that I have seen tumor regression. So I don't wanna to use tumor suppression, meaning removing the tumor. Uh, and it was proven through diagnostic testing, but uh, I wanna remind everyone that uh, I practice in what we call an onco um, integrative oncology um, practice that does IPT, low dose uh, insulin, insulin potentiated therapy. So we combine IPT with high dose vitamin C. And this is also the, the, the dilemma that we have now in our practice that we throw everything to our patients is so that it can work and stick. It does stick, uh, I tell you, there in, in, in our protocols at the cancer center. But uh, to tell you the truth, is it vitamin C that did that, high dose vitamin C or the low dose chemotherapy? It's really hard. But I can tell you that it does bring something good to the table in terms of cancer therapy. Are you using all the um, IV antioxidants and my cocktail, or are you also using photosensitizers, um, uh, you know, immunotherapy, uh, other things, low dose chemotherapy? Or, or your clinic, it's only for health optimization with IV antioxidant minerals and, and uh, vitamins. Mm -hmm. Some of those vitamins, as you say, on nutrition, high dose is pro oxidant, right. like high dose vitamin C and uh, Alpha level acid, but the question is that: uh, Is this what you do, or you add other things beside that? Um, so I actually consult in in the cancer center. My own practice, I focus on more of naturals. So I give high dose vitamin C, glutathione. But when when I uh, when I go to the cancer center and I see patients there, that's when I actually combine IPT with these high dose vitamin C. So our protocol actually is, uh, again, is it called a boot camp? So we do three weeks for these patients if we combine IPT, so they cannot be given on the same day of these alternative therapies. They are given on a separate day. And if you, yeah, you're asking about other combinations, we also use infrared um, therapy on these patients. Um, a good machine there is the Biomat that we use. And also the, um, the lymphatic uh, machine that you stand on so to facil facilitate drainage. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a combination of therapies that I do. And uh, if I've done myself uh, just integrative approaches or natural therapies alone, I okay, have. Okay. Sorry? Sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, so I've done both. Uh, that's why I can vouch for the combination of chemo with alternative and just alternative therapies alone. May I ask a question? Yes, John. Hey, um, 
I think Dr. Nario is one of our homeopathic specialists, right? Yes. And I noticed you never mentioned the word homeopathy in your entire presentation. But I was wondering, in order to make these, to optimize these vitamins and nutrients, uh, do you add homeopathic to the injectable solution? Uh, that's a good, uh, yeah, that's a good point you brought up there. We were until they stopped heal to come in uh, okay. the country. So we have, we have done okay. that. And lymphomyosot, I'm sure you know about that. No, I don't. Oh, these are heal products that we use uh, a lot of in terms, and we help these patients detoxify themselves. And these can be done through IV, IM. Um, unfortunately, now, as you said, heal is our, our go-to, now they stop that. So yeah. uh, we do orals instead. Uh, okay. But again, it's I, I like the IV therapies. I like the injectables. But yes, we do homeopathic detox and support in relation to even the so-called kind of conventional IPT that we do and the nutrient therapies that we do. Yeah. So uh, you're having the same thing on the West Coast that the feds are trying to stop the homeopathy, especially the injectable from heel. The good stuff is what they're trying to stop. Yes. Oh, here's a new here's something for you, John. So in the yeah. Philippines, we have clinics there. So there we do homeopathy. So we have access to heal. We have access to guna. So all these, these uh, European um, homeopathic products, it's a free for all over there. So we still have access to that. Great. And hey, Dr. Nario, uh, quick question on um, OsteoStrong. I don't know if you've gone to the OsteoStrong here in Reno, Nevada. Uh, no, not really. I haven't. They have a PEM, and Dr. Khan or Khan might know about this. They have a PEMF mat, and while you're doing the mat, they also have the uh, lymphatic air um, gloves that go over your uh, legs and your arms, and they also have one that go on the chest. And it's mm -hmm. pretty powerful. Have you ever used anything like that? No, uh, again, uh, I have patients who buy like the, uh, the the Beamer. Um, yeah. yeah, they're using a lot of. Um, I, I said concept is still is the same. If they're infrared, they're doing lymphatic drainage. Right. Um, all of these things we promote. I mean, whatever shape or form that is, and it sounds like yeah, what you're pertaining to, uh, something of the same concept. So yeah, we've seen different things from. Uh, even amulets, uh, crystals that patients bring in in the cancer center, uh, okay. and, and anything, again, may it be placebo effect or not, anything that brings something good to the table, may it be psychological, may it be physical, we are very open, um, and we've seen so many different forms. And it might be funny to some, but for us, it's very acceptable. So on the patient is placed in a very good spot for, for uh, making them uh, have a positive reaction to therapies and results. Do you okay. do cancer mm -hmm. pharmacogenetics? Yes, we do. I think uh, I mentioned that in our last um, talk, and Dr. Bill has mentioned to me, I mean, mentioned that to me to expound on that a little bit more, that we do the, the Greek test, and it actually can test for any type of, of agent that you want. And if you send, if it's not in the standard list of, of RGCC or the Greek test, you can give, uh, you can send out a sample of that specific medicine to see if the patient's cancer will respond to that. Is it realistic, those cancer tests, or there is some mistake? And because I, I have access to all of those, and sometimes you see discrepancy and um, not accurate. That's one of the reasons that the FDA is not approving it here in the United States. Right. So what do you think? Did you see any difference? Did you check other cancer pharmacogenetics in Germany and do the, the, the discrepancy here, in other words, uh, see yeah. the difference? Yeah, so in our practice, we actually tried one from Korea, one from uh, Germany, and yes, the, the last one was in Greece. Um, I mean, in terms of accuracy, I think Greece has been the more specific one, but let me tell you this. Uh, do I agree with the uh, recommendations of, of, of Greece uh, all the time? Not really. For the reason that, for example, we had a patient who got tested for ivermectin, 
and ivermectin is low on the on the rung uh, of that of that test that they did. And I watched Stefan's um, um, webinar about uh, lactoferrin and ivermectin. So I placed that patient on on that combination, and that's one of the I guess one of the additions that actually changed this patient's PSA and turned into a better a, a more controlled type of um, PSA. Uh, I didn't glad to hear that it's, it's level. I'm sorry. Amazing. Glad to hear that. Right. So that's why, I mean, even if the Greek test doesn't give me much um, to offer in terms of ivermectin, I now make it a standard to put my patients on, on um, ivermectin and lactoferrin. So that's why. The, How that's much why lactoferrin I, do you use? Sorry? How much lactoferrin do you use? Oh, uh, Stefan, I think Stefan, how much did you recommend, Stefan? 500 milligrams a day at least. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah. So another example for you would be fembendazole. So fembendazole is a dog dewormer. So that's something that is out there. And I have seen, um, Billy, it was, it was taught to us by our patients. This was not brought to, uh, to us by the Greek test or RGCC. But when, when these patients came in with mel melanoma stage four, liver cancer stage four, and I have one specific patient right now who was breast cancer and just being maintained on fembendazole. This is a dog dewormer. And that actually was the only one that leveled down their CA2729 and 15-3. We, we did IPT on this patient. We did the whole nine yards. And it's very hard until, um, and fembendazole didn't show up on the test. And she just took it and there it was. So that's why I don't tell patients this is the end all. Uh, when they see the test results, I always tell them that it's definitely worth a shot. At least we have a guide, but let's not follow this up to a T. Let's uh, let's just do whatever we can for the cancer. Uh, Dr. Dario, I have a yes. quick question. Yes. Uh, very good lecture, by the way. Uh, very informative. Um, oh, thank you. you. I actually was inspired to put myself on, on a vitamin uh, C drip right at the moment. Um, because two people said that I sounded like I was getting sick. So boom, there you go. Uh, but my question is, um, I, is this mast cell activation syndrome. So have you done the deep dive with, um, any of the mechanisms and, or do you have a certain protocol for people who are having like mast cell activation syndromes, allergies? Right. So one of the, the bigger things that I, I use for them really is, again, to, to lower in that, that reactivity uh, of the system. Uh, and of course, the vitamins that we give here, the, the, of course, they're the standard for, for me to give because majority of these patients are also nutrient deficient. But what I focus on for, for mast cell really is the stimulus. I always want to find the cause for this. And one of the, the bigger things that I've seen from mast cell is really not as part of this, this uh, lecture that I gave. Um, it, it's an, it's, there's not much studies on this, but I got this from, um, I got this from other practitioners like Dr. Schellenberger, ozone therapy. So ozone therapy as, as his, according to his guidance to me, actually has proven to stabilize the, the, the cell walls of these histamine related cells. So I use a lot of ozone therapy uh, in my practice. So one of them would be EBU therapy or ozone UVBI. And I have seen, I didn't, I, I'm not saying it, it squashes all the allergic responses, but you would notice that the, the amount uh, of, of attacks and even intensity uh, of these patients in terms of having this histamine response lessens and becomes more tolerable for them. So again, that's not in this lecture, but uh, that's one thing that I can definitely uh, be on top of my head as I remember that's effective for it. Okay, and then I have a, uh, another have you, burning you, question. Uh, real quick, have you used HIST DAO, the new HIST DAO by Eximogen? It's their third best seller. Oh, yeah. So, no, I haven't done that, uh, but I have heard good things about it. I used DHIST of, uh, of um, orthomolecular. I mean, it helps the corset in there, but of course, it's slow acting, it's oral. Uh, but DAO, I think it's more for the GI tract to prevent the, the enzyme there, to control the enzyme in the gut. Okay. Is this, is this an IV form of DAO? Uh, no, I think Joel is pertaining to um, Zymogen, the oral 
right, Joe? Sorrel, correct. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is um, you had mentioned that you're uh, you're from Philippines, I think. Yeah. And um, I have I have a lot of Filipino uh, friends and patients here in Chicago, and I always get asked this question mm -hmm. about um, uh, lightening of the skin uh, with glutathione <laughs> IV. And so I'm, right. I'm curious: is it is it really true? Um, does it last long, or is it just uh, buffering the redox, which is maybe um, lightening some of the hyperpigmentation that is only dark because of inflammation? Right. So that's it. I actually looked into that too because uh, as I uh, I was I also see patients in the Philippines, and one of the things that they request for me is glutathione because it's actually a dermatological type of therapy there. It makes them whiter. So us Filipinos, we like to watch foreign films and like, oh, we like to be like that, that white is like that. But if you think about it, the Caucasians wants to be darker. So it's vice versa. But the studies mm -hmm. have shown here that it actually more of is improving blood flows to the skin. So you're right in relation to inflammation, when you have inflammation, from from free radicals and pro oxidative um, uh, molecules, now you'll have inflammation in relation to now lessening the flow or the diameter to towards your dermis, epidermis, and, and thus even the the melanin pigments has of course less um, um, activity. So it's as we describe this as the effect of glutathione, it's more of a glowing skin rather than making oh. people white because of just, yes, the, the increase in blood flow. And, and studies have, have shown really that it really doesn't whiten skin. I, I've tried to look for that, even the topicals, even the creams, uh, it really doesn't, it's not backed up by, by literature. Okay, now I was curious, and if, and if they do try a protocol, is this something that they do like twice a week, a certain amount of milligrams? for six weeks or something, or is there really no, no real protocol? Uh, well, to be honest with you, in the Philippines, they kind of just go to these one-stop shops. It's not, they, they're getting China products, unfortunately, and I have seen patients react badly to this. So that's why in terms of protocols, um, what they do over there is they do this as an IV push. And okay. uh, I, I think they're giving it at like um, 400, 600 milligrams. Um, as an IV push. Uh, the thing there is they don't know that they can eat. There's no, in short, there's no real protocol, but the more you do glutathione, as I noticed with my patients, uh, they, they do manifest that glowing skin uh, more if you're giving them higher doses. And I give a lot of co cosmetic um, IVs just for like uh, collagen uh, enhancing. Uh, but uh, again, it's really a free for all and a once a week is what I recommend. Number one, it's expensive, it's pricey. You get poked, you don't even want to get poked that much, especially if you're the patient. So once a week, uh, uh, 600 to 1,000 milligrams is what I recommend. And most of the time, give glutathione with even like a small, a small Myers cocktail um, or even like a, B, a push, a vitamin push, so that you can maximize the effects of glutathione. Well, how are you maximizing the effects? Anything specific or? Well, uh, when you, of course, when you give glutathione as an antioxidant, when you give the other B complexes, vitamin C in low doses, you're promoting more antioxidation. And the thing there, again, it's not directly glutathione, but it's some more of a synergist, synergistic concertive effort to get those antioxidants. Since you have an access already, you want to put everything in that one access rather than taking it orally. So people say, I'll just take it orally. Nah, not really. It's not going to be absorbed much. IV is always kind of like the best form on my, in my experience. Yeah, I, this makes sense actually, because um, according to one of your diagrams, that would decrease the conversion of, or it would uh, help increase the conversion of homocysteine into its uh, breakdown product or uh, actually into glutathione. And so you're, you're going to be buffering the redox from that angle as well. And, uh, you know, the first time I did glutathione, that was a uh, IV. It was like a wow effect. I mean, it was literally like um, I had taken a stimulant. I Actually, I had done it with a friend who was also a patient. And we both 
uh, realized we were both kind of really hyper chatty, like, you know, like we had just taken a, a Sudafed or something. Right. Um, but I, but I think it's self-limited. I mean, it's not something that you get every time. It's just probably, I had so much ox oxidative stress that that instant relief of that stress must have, you know, really boosted my neurochemicals. Right. Yeah, it does happen. I've seen that a lot too, especially for the ones that are super stressed and super high oxidative stress. I mean, clinically you can assess that and they would benefit and respond faster and better. Hey, Dr. Nario, what about CJC 1295 or growth hormone? How do you incorporate that into this process? Do you wait until they've killed the cancer and you think you're on the rebound? And then you Oh, so yeah, that's a good question, Joel. Uh, with CJC, as we all know, it's uh, again, another growth hormone, indirect growth hormone stimulator. So when you talk about cancer, that's something that we, we do usually avoid um, because again, could it be, could it be not? I mean, I have seen on uh, practitioners use, to be honest with you, I've seen it. Pa uh, practitioners putting patients on growth hormone when they have cancer. And most of the time they don't end up real well. Uh, that's why, but the trajectory, if you think about it, uh, growth hormone, as it lowers down, studies have shown that cancer, the cancer curve goes up. So the, the thing here is you definitely want to negate that. But the thing here is, should you introduce growth hormone now the patient has cancer or should growth hormone be started before the patient has cancer? So that's probably a better approach on our end, but on our end, uh, we we definitely play it safe. We don't want to put any growth hormone um, releasing hormone or actual growth hormone in an active cancer patient. Do you have any um, experiences like wow effects, like certain IV combinations where it's just that you stick your one sort of big gun that you just know. It's going to make the patient feel better. Um, you know, they're going to have more energy. Do you have like really specific ones that are that stand out from just your standard regular IV therapy? Most of what most of them, I people don't really feel that much. I mean, it's we know that we're doing a good thing, but it's always nice, you know, if you can do a specific IV and you sleep sleep like a baby that night. You know, that's like what NAD plus always did for me um, right. or something that, you know, you're just, you're, you're um, burned out, um, tired or jet lagged, like you said, and you get this special concoction, you know, not just your standard. And it's like, it's like, wow, you know, that really did something. Like, I mean, if somebody is a poor methylator and, and they're taking methylated vitamins for the first time, you're going to feel something. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, I'm just curious if you, if you have any, you know, any in your experience, any of your private something you did a little bit different that did something really positive. Yeah, yeah, out. yeah. I agree with you with the with the B12. I mean, that's everybody's go to, right? B12. People. That's why they, we have B shot bars here. So the, I mean, again, that's a, a hidden myth. It's not going to be always going to be the same outcome, but there are, there's two that I actually have. So I, I, I saw this one is actually a, I don't want to promote this, but I, with, for a patient who actually has adrenal fatigue. So I think you, you lecture on this and you even promoted this hydrocortisone. So I uh, tried yeah. that on patients with adrenal fatigue and that snapped them out of it. Another Another, another example for you are my cancer patients. So we give them uh, dexamethasone as a pre-op uh, before giving chemotherapy. And these, these patients, when they get a low-dose dexamethasone, they just, they just tell me, wow, I, I, this is the best day ever. And you're going to think that these <laughs> patients are, oh, you're going to be run down because you got chemo today. No, they're not. They said, I was like cleaning the room. I was going out, washing dishes. But you had chemo today. You shouldn't be doing that. No, I just had this so much energy. But that is, again, short-lived. I, I know. But if you're going for, and I don't want to promote that. Just This is just me sharing my story. But uh, this is just something that I see that people jump out of their chairs from. Just because as, as a proof, 
there is ongoing uh, adrenal um, hypofunctioning. I don't, we, we don't use the adrenal fatigue term anymore, right? So, but that's one. Another one is something that, uh, this is not new for us. It's been a, a two year uh, machine that we have. It's called EBU. So extracorporeal blood ozonation and oxygenation. So this is even with one session, I don't know if you heard of this, but this is ozone-based therapy. But this is a patient, I had patients who had chronic pain and it was always tired, like fibromyalgia type of pain. And one to two sessions of this um, specific IV, I see a turnaround um, energy-wise as well. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I've been doing IV therapies for almost five years. And this is the only IV that I have seen patients turn around with one to two sessions of. And it's just unfortunate that it's expensive. Um, it's, it's, there's a challenge in terms of accessing patients because you need double lines for it. Uh, but that's just, yeah, it's not part of my lecture, but that's one that I would encourage everyone to try and see. No, and that, this, is, and this is where the magic is. Um, the, this one that you're talking about, the EBU, is that basically apheresis? Um, so that where it's taking it out, similar to plasma phoresis, taking it out, the blood out one's arm, and it's cleaning it, ozonating it, and then putting it back in the other arm. Is that right? So it's uh, it's extracorporeal blood ozonation and oxygenation. So what happens here is you have double access, two lines, and then the blood is getting drawn out. And as the blood gets drawn out, it goes through a kidney filter, a dialysis filter. Sorry, uh, it's a, almost like a dialysis machine. And this machine, of course, um, uh, filters, as the word itself says. And then you add also heparin uh, on, on, the, on the blood samples to thin it out. And then as we like that, right? Because now, as we all know, most COVID-infected uh, patients has hypercoagulable blood. And then now you add ozone in that um, kidney um, dialysis filter and also oxygen. So you would actually see this blood that is dark coming out of your other arm, returning to your other arm in a pink color you now because of more oxygenation that occurred in that blood. And even before that blood goes back to you, it goes through UV lights, UVA, UVB, UVC. Uh, this now, um, it has a pleiotrophic effect on these cells, um, even killing microorganisms that are light sensitive. So enhances your white cells, red cells, and even platelets. So it's just a very rich type of blood that goes in, and it, it filters two liters of your blood for every session. So we offer three sessions of this for patients, because when you reach three sessions, that's basically six liters, and the the blood vol total blood volume of the body is almost five to six liters. So you basically totally had a a, a complete overhaul and cleanup of your blood system. So it is, it is out there, and I can help you with these um, if you need information about the, these machines. Yeah, no, that, that would be fantastic. And that's amazing. And here's my thing. You know, when people are sick and they're chronically sick, they, they, I think they forget what it feels like to feel normal, to feel right. good. And, and even if, like, even in that situation with the dexamethasone, you know, they said they're cleaning the, the house, they're doing this, they, they, you know, they're feeling, they're feeling like themselves again. And um, it's almost as if, if you get a glimpse of that, then you realize, okay, I might be able to get there again. Um, otherwise, um, it's, a, it's like people fall in love with their misery. Um, and, and, and because they don't know what feeling good feels like anymore. Right. Uh, and, and but and then the other thing with hydrocortisone, keep in mind, that's essentially bioidentical cortisol uh, because that's what it's being converted to. So it's not like prednisone and triamcinolone and even dexamethasone uh, because it's it doesn't have that that fast rise and fall and with the rapid heartbeat and you know keeping you awake and all that stuff. It's it's smoother. It, it, it works at, I guess you could say, more at the physiological timeline of things. So you get that sort of natural energy burst, but that's not, but without the side effects, because if you stay within a certain dose, and this is based on Dr. Jeffrey's uh, book, he practiced sometime between the 1950s and 1980s, back when I, I say doctors were doctors. And... Um, 
I mean, he, he treated everything with it, but if you stay within a certain dose range, that's just physiological dosing. So if you're adrenal fatigue, you're just getting them physiologically dosed. You're not going to get the skin thinning and the, you know, the other side effects, um, bringing down the immune system. In fact, according to his book, the low dose actually boosts the immune system a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe not something to do chronically all the time. I mean, we have to learn the mechanisms and, and treat the root causes, but a lot of my patients, I have them uh, keep hydrocortisone around because if they're having a bad day or they didn't get enough sleep, one little hydrocortisone can take, uh, can turn that around for them. And again, they feel like they've got control over their, you know, how they feel. I agree. I agree with that. Hey, one more quick question. Um, it might not be quick. Do you use hyperbaric or do you send them to a hyperbaric chamber? And what about chiro therapy and cold dunk? I know Stefan started to use um, cold therapy also. Yes, so that's definitely a big one. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something I promote. It's just that here in Reno, the only thing we have here is I think the, the hospital has the hard shell. I have, I, 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 you would hear that hard shell, soft shell, it doesn't really matter. But majority of the patients that I see respond well would be more on the on the hard shells. Um, and I'm, if they have soft shell access, I, I definitely say yes to it still. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that, and I've seen it in patients, especially Lyme's, uh, the chronically ill, um, autoimmune conditions. So I promote that definitely. And even yeah, the the heat shock proteins, the cold shock proteins of jumping into cold and hyperbaric um, cryotherapy jumping into cold water. So definitely those are something that we also promote. So any chiropractic therapy, definitely. So that's why the heart of integrative therapy and even integrative oncology does not only focus on IPT, but it's also the multimodality that we offer to these patients. But yes, Joe, those are good interventions. Let me, let me just make sure that people here um, understand cancer. I think Dr. Patel is one of the pioneer for managing cancer. Um, and she has all the tools there, and still it's it's a struggle um, because cancer is a very smart creature. And, you know, the mainstream medicine using chemotherapy, radiotherapy, um, it may help in um, targeting the, the proliferation and use the proliferation of the cancer. Um, but those cancer, even with chemotherapy and high dose and radiotherapy, they can resist that by all the tricks that they do. And one of the tricks that they do, which is very hard, you know, it's, you know, well, many of them, uh, but it's, it's the tumor microenvironment. Um, that's where the problem is. Um, and that's the reason you see chemotherapy and radiotherapy resistance because the tumor secrete chemicals that modulate the immune system away from TH1, which is TH2 and TH17. And also the, the, the tumor shuts down the mitochondria um, and works on glycolysis. And I think you're doing very good with uh, your, uh, the hypoglycemic shock with insulin. And you have the fibrosis as well. And that's one of the problems I had with my dad. And I don't know where about it you know, they, they start wrapping themselves with fibrotic tissues. So whatever you do, it does not even get there because they squeeze those blood vessels and those chemotherapy, those lymphocytes will not get there and the immune system cannot get there. And they are building the shield of fibrosis along with shield of platelets and clots. And all of this, it's, it's helping this, this cancer to move. And, and also there's, the PDL1 and CTL4 and immune oncologists, they're very excited about those antibodies to block them. Um, and, and so a cocktail of immunotherapy, chemotherapy, photosensitizers, um, and doing cryo and radiofrequency ablation. So it's you really, it's like a war. And just one weapon is not going to be enough. You, ha you, have, you have to hit the cancer from all different um, directions in order to approach the shrinking and improve the program to the, pro the prognosis, but just giving vitamins and all that it does help to extend their little bit their life. 
optimizing their health. Um, but um, and that's what you can claim in the United States that you are not really managing cancer. Cancer, you're just more or less trying to prove the quality of health. And if you state that, then I think everybody here can can practice uh, integrative oncology, and you don't claim to the patient that you are um, trying to get into remission there because with what you're doing, um, it will be like one over a million for cancer to be uh, remit, uh, but you can definitely solve the process there. And especially with all your high dose vitamins and minerals, it does help to activate the mitochondria and mitophagy because that's what it is, you know, basically what you're doing. But if you really want to have integrative cancer, you really need to do everything and the only doctor who does everything, including platelets nanoparticle, delivering the drugs into the pathology using platelets nanoparticle, I think Dr. Patel here. So, um, and I wish if we have access to your clinic and your people there, we can um, share with them our cancer protocols and all that and, and see how we can get more better results. And I, I give Dr. Patel, she's the, a good example um, or maybe the top doctor right now, I know that she does everything. Although she has limited with tools, like if it's good to have radio frequency ablation and fiber optic photodynamic therapy, injecting metal and blue and ICG and activating with light. But it's just hard in the United States to do all of this, possibly a center in Bahamas, which I do have. And if you all want to become integrative oncology and you have patients you want to help with cancer, because it's the highest rate. I mean, you know, cancer represent uh, your, in your lifespan, 50%, flip off a coin, you're gonna have a cancer. Flip off a coin, everybody here. And so there is a population that are looking for those uh, outside thinker like Dr. William Bill and Patel and yourself. Um, the system is very tough here in the United States, but the right claim and the right umbrella possibly can do a lot. And in case if you can't, then definitely I, I do have a Bahamas center where everybody can send their patients or be there for vacation at the same time treating your patients. It just, uh, it's it's a struggle. And I myself, I had cancer, uh, thyroid cancer. So I know the, the whole sad feeling and ex experience of having cancer. And, and I wish all of you will start working to become integrative oncology or chronic disease prevention and management and, and set up the protocols that, that we can share and then optimize by the feedbacks that we're getting from patients. Yes, um, I think um, we are starting, yeah. I spoke to our, our group in the Cancer Center about that. We definitely will reach out to you, Dr. Halasa, for that. Hey, Dr. Nario, um, we haven't had Dr. Forsyth on in a while. And Dr. Patel, I don't know if you've heard one of Dr. Forsythe's presentations. He's one of the top cancer doctors in America. I believe he's got a 69 to 72% success rate with stage four. And he's one of the doctors I believe you've learned from too. He's still here. He's still operational. He is close to retirement. But if we can get the two of them together, and to talk together, I think that would just be huge for the whole movement, because like I've mentioned before, we believe a little over 580,000 veterans got diagnosed with cancer for 20 years ago. Can you arrange for it? Say again, Dr. Patel? Can you arrange for it? I think we can. Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and one thing to share for, uh, to you guys, one thing that we're looking at in the cancer center, so peptide therapy is on the rise. And um, the peptide, Dr. Pazel probably knows about this, ammonium tetrathiomolybdate, or TM as we call it. And this is uh, a peptide that actually deprives copper buildup in the, in the system. So I don't know if this is something that you can turn into a nanoparticle, but this is currently available in capsule form. And this is a peptide that we're trying to look into that uh, can hopefully be one of the, the bigger help or assistance with, with cancer therapy. So but if, just, just if, being out if there. the peptide, it, 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 does it have a long uh, amino acid chain? Uh, because peptides usually have a five or seven amino acids. So 
Uh, oh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I really don't know. It's just something that uh, we're now looking into. Uh, and we're starting to try to try it on patients. But uh, if you have more information about it um, or anybody here uh, in, in the call has more info um, that could back up our use, that would be great. But that's something that we're looking into now. Where is Dr. Forsyth uh, practicing? Uh, Reno, Nevada. Reno? Okay. Mm -hmm. Work with him? Yes, uh, okay. we work in, in the same facility. So I, okay, I can definitely... Reno, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that's injectable, anything that's injectable, it's sterile. You can load inside plate this nanoparticle. And the idea of plate with nanoparticles um, came in the beginning when I was doing red blood cells, loading it with drugs in Baylor College in 2000 with Dr. Frank or so. And then in a certain way, I, I find out red blood cells of the hemoglobins, it's very toxic and difficulty. And, and then I came up with platelets nanoparticle. And then it happened that there's a big farm it's in California, it's called Silo Therapeutic. And they are doing platelets nanoparticle, uh, FDA approved, and they're gonna mass produce it. Um, what's the challenge is that they use PLGA uh, in addition to platelets, because the PLGA will stabilize those drugs. And that's what they're looking for. Um, well, it will take another 10 years for them to be approved and sell their vial platelets uh, nanoparticle loaded with anything you want, anything. Um, we skipped the PLGA because as a clinicians, you can, uh, you, albumin inside the serum can be a stabilizer for the drug. And then with the platelets, and we have a process the way that we, we do it in a way it will be completely sterile. And if you do this, but it's still you need to work with many other things, immunotherapy, and there's antibodies FDA approved, anti-CTLA, anti-BDL1, you need to use losartan, you need to use low-dose chemotherapy, you need to activate with light, you need radio frequency ablation, you need cryotherapy. It's many layers, metabolic redox, um, all the things that you're doing, um, and it's costly uh, for the patients really to survive uh, with all those expenses of all those drugs and methods, and it's just hard for the cash. So it's very good, maybe in the future, somebody here who can develop a nonprofit organization just to collect the money for integrative oncology from the donors. So you can help your patients because it's really a very expensive um, to mitigate all of this. Uh, it's very costly, especially with cash, and unrealistic to do everything that you want to do to really manage the cancer for patients, especially the one that that don't have that enough money. It would be good if Joy, you come up with a nonprofit organization for cancer and you will see a lot of response and a lot of donation and dictate that just for patients with cancer. And you will see a lot of people will pay money because billionaires and millionaires, if it's lifespan 50%, they're gonna have cancer. And if you tell anybody who's billionaire, millionaire, 50% you're gonna have cancer. So better for you to donate. And I think that's the approach of Dr. Platts when he was trying to <laughs> collect money for, for investment. Um, at least you have something that helps um, to treat cancer, but it's just expensive. Have you experienced that? I mean, Dr. Patel, I know that she's all the time struggling to put it because of the of the cost. Well, what about you? Is that that's a, the big challenge cost, there? Cost is the big problem. So you have to you have to find out equally effective something which is less expensive. But as far as the nanoparticle is concerned, you know we we. We do the chemo immunotherapy combo, and but when we do that and give vitamin C and methylene blue, we have found that uh, some patients they chelate their calcium so much that uh, sometimes we have to give 20 to 30 ml of calcium. So, um, I don't, I, I'm not too sure that what would that hypothesis be um, that why, I mean, we are treating clinically that the patient would 
would develop chills and patient would have a lot of rigor. So we know that and as soon as we give calcium, it gets better. But we have to keep on giving till, till they stabilize. And, uh, and yes, it chelates, uh, cal I mean, vitamin C chelates, but we have not nano vitamin C. We give vitamin C following the uh, cancer therapy. So we have stopped giving them vitamin C now. We give it in, on the next day. It's just probably too much oxidative load. Yeah, let me, let me explain to you exactly. If when you see a patient shaking and all that, there's two reasons. One is the tumor lysis syndrome and that release all the potassium. As potassium is the reason of the arrhythmia and shaking and all these things. It's it's they a tumor lysis it. syndrome or they hemolytic uh, hemolysis that may happen because of all this combination of those drugs. But most of the time tumor lysis syndrome is the reason and that's why you need to have calcium glu gluconate next to you all the time and when you manage patient with cancer even with chemotherapy they can end up with tumor lysis syndrome and you get all this um, thing and it's potassium release from the tumor when you blow them up or even red blood cells sometimes they get sensitive and they blow up and they release those potassium i think that's what you are experienced with your cancer it does not mean that you're doing bad thing in fact you're doing too 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 good too much and that's the problem with cancer i mean i i see a lot of patients when they give them the chemotherapy, they can end up in the ICU because of the tumor lysis syndrome. Um, so something you need to, and I think Dr. Patel experienced a lot of it. Uh, that's where you need to have uh, calcium gluconate, gluconate next to you. Right. Dr. Halasa, to answer your um, question, we do have uh, a foundation in the cancer center uh, that offers financial assistance to these cancer patients. So we are aware of this monetary need of these cancer therapies and how heavy it is on the budget. So this foundation was made to help the, I guess the ones who really can't pay much. It's more of a financial assistance, not a total um, coverage for their payments for the therapy, but you're right. That's one of the bigger fallouts for patients who want to do it, but they can't. So this foundation is supported by whom? Uh, it's still under the, the cancer center. They created the foundation. Um, the, the intricacies of that, I really don't know much, but it's something that we offer that they can apply for the foundation grant or foundation money that's there to help them with, uh, I guess, even uh, to lessen the, the actual la final pricing of their therapies. Well, we have Joy here. Joy is very good um, in you know, bringing people and publicly, good public speaking. Uh, if Joe will open up this organization and all the vets and all that, and you have access to it, I mean, you will do very good, Joe. I think this, you're better than a doctor to do those things because most of the time, if you're a doctor and you're doing those things, um, they see that, are oh, you collecting money for you? But if you have somebody who's outsider, right? have passionate like Joe, he can definitely be successful in opening a nonprofit organization for for cancer and a lot of people will donate. I absolutely agree. I'm definitely looking into it now. I've already created the for profit because that's a government structure and that's where you get the government contracts. And then you also have the nonprofit on the side so the two can work together and I'll work on it as fast as possible. I didn't realize how bad the cancer problem was with active duty military, let alone regular veterans. So it probably also means that our uh, first, second, third responders are also having problems. So together, that whole big pyramid should be able to you know, be brought together. Well, Iraq's war, I can tell you I think the vets uh, are getting into Iraq exposure for all the chemicals that they they send. They also use uranium bullets, right, in Iraq to destroy tanks, um, and all those chemicals and fume and gas and everything that's in the in the war. All of those people of uh, military, they even possibly it's not just the, like a normal of us fifty percent of flip of a coin. They're gonna have at least seventy percent, eighty percent chance of having cancer during their lifespan. 
because of the, the chemicals that they exposed during the war. So I think you can do very good uh, coming up with a good lecture. You have Dr. William Bales can support you in this. And, um, and, and you have Dr. Patel definitely had one of the pioneers I can see. I bet Dr. Patel protocol, can, I can see she is the top in uh, maybe in the entire world because she does everything. She may be missing some tools like fiber optic um, and radio frequency ablations. But if she got access to this, she will be the top of the top. And you were going to say something, Dr. Patel? Oh, yeah. I, I was saying that uh, we have some, some uh, you know, vets and some of these uh, war people they call for the appointment, but they cannot pay, so we cannot take care because we are not not for profit, and we and everything is so expensive, so we just cannot, you know, I mean as it is, our our prices are not very high, so we cannot do it. So we, it it would be good if if there is some support, and we can go there and and tell them to request that and get the finances. Because you know they they do so much for the country, and then we can't do anything for them. It's very frustrating. Even if the grants is is only for buying the equipments or the the drug itself, and then you charge the patient for the clinical service, that will be even better. Like let's say, okay, we need all of this, and Dr. Patel will send it to the organization, and they just pay the medicine, right? then that's that's the most affordable uh realistic way and then the patients will pay them their clinical service to the doctor to perform it as they have all the drugs uh, being purchased by the organization something you may consider that the best option because it's too expensive really to cover everything agree agree i'll definitely look into it as hard as possible like I said, I had no idea how bad the problem was. I mean, I knew cancer is bad, but I didn't think it was this bad with our military. It's it's horrendous. And that, that means there's money out there. There's no doubt. It's got to be. You would believe that we get at least four to five calls every day for stage four cancer. Okay. So, so if we are able to treat them all, I mean, we would not be able to say anything else, but... But unfortunately, everybody, you know, they cannot afford everything. So we have a, we have a do it all, or we have a, some special protocols we have designed, and which is equally good. So so we have a, the low finance uh, protocol, and we have a, everything you can do, and we we have a stage three B uh, lung cancer. And, and that guy is doing so good. When he came, he was dying. And now, now he's back and he's a, he's a big, uh, <clears throat> he has his company and he's make, making a lot of different defense uh, contracts. So, I mean, he, he was just uh, in, in his early 50. And it, it, was, it was so good, but he can afford it. Where there are, there are many similar conditions they can't afford it. So we have to figure it out. What is the minimum we can do? And our methylene blue and um, the methylene blue protocol has been very effective along with the other oral medication, some intravenous and, and you know, whatever, whatever they can afford, we can personalize and make, make optimal for them. I know you're going to want to uh, give us a talk on that, on that, on the protocols, Dr. Patel. Correct? Well, when it is personalized, I don't, I'm not too sure, but I can, I can give the talk on on tumor microenvironment mm -hmm. uh, and what we are trying to trying to understand, and and by by understanding that what we can do. Because it is, it is always the tumor, but sometimes the patient's uh, own, own immune system is not good. 
their 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 own own nutrient pool is not enough so we have to look at everything we just cannot just concentrate only on cancer we have to first look at is the is the what is lacking in the person that ended up getting cancer what are the other environmental factor what are the toxics what is how are we going to clean them where, where what do we start so each patient is is completely a different ball game okay yeah i mean there is there is an affordable version basic one that every patient with cancer i think it's metlam blue photodynamic therapy is one of the affordable way you can do it first and then after that you just layer it down based on the finance of the of the patients so and we sometimes do the the um the ozone uh bpt biophotomodulation ozone treatment and then we give them them the uh methylene blue and followed by vitamin c iv along with the other ingredients in it and then we use the photodynamic treatment and they have done well and 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 then at one conference uh, they were mentioning about use of uh, phosphatidylcholine in some of these patients and but the you know patient has to understand why we are we are trying to give because most of the patients those who come to us at least 50% they have gone through a detail i mean all they bring the ncbi articles to us so and, and then they they send it to my office please help dr patel review this so so you know we want to discuss this at the next next meeting consultation so uh, um not to interrupt um ty and charlene this just jogged my memory ty and charlene bollinger they've done some big huge uh shows and one of the filipino doctors he couldn't afford all these expensive protocols so he started um powderizing pancreatic enzymes i don't know if uh yeah, he used them he used them okay yeah yeah i'm not sure who the doctor I mean, I to me I, I have you i i did did uh, listen to the whole series at one time right and, and at the end i got the information uh, impression that it was good it was but there there was some financial interest of a person putting it together okay okay gotcha yeah cancer is it's very difficult and the very important thing is that don't uh, be very optimistic with patients you know give them high hope and then they get disappointed. I mean, you, uh, and then disappointed can put them in depression and very bad mood. Uh, but anyway, I think it's the best way to say to the patients, we will improve your quality of life. We do our best to shrink the tumor. And they need to know it's, it's gonna be costly. Uh, we will try our best to- You to know, I, I've been reviewing a lot of conventional literature and I, I, I figured it out there. If they, the person lives for three more months, oh, there was a quality of life and they extended the life. Period. What three months is, is uh, a, and so much ex use of finances in, for, for that? I, I have a great question. Where we change not the quality of life, but we, we, we really help them because when they come from conventional treatment and transition over our office, we, we know that, that they are so much depleted in everything. And when we, and then they, you, you look at that and skin perfusion is so poor and you know they're dying kind of. And, and when by the time they come and we, we increase six, nine, 12 months, so, so that is really quality of life. What they say is quality of life is really not quality of life. Because we are prolonging, we are prolonging three months of life and feeling sick and going home and and just eat the couch potato or go to bed. That that what they, that three months. 
if the three months if they are able to go out they do whatever they wanted to do yes that makes a difference well the thing is that with chemotherapy radiotherapy mainstream medicine after they do all of this and definitely they will suppress the immune system and damage the whole metabolites of the body and the microbiome and i think they will be completely out of chemotherapy radiotherapy completely oxidative stress and inflammation all over their body um and that itself they may actually shorten the lifespan uh, instead of, um, and, and that's one of the thing about the mainstream medicine, which is they do same protocol for the same type of cancer for everybody, w even without knowing that those chemotherapy, whether they are sensitive or not sensitive to it because it's genetically. And if they are not sensitive to those chemotherapy, for some reason, I think almost 50%, and even more, they are not sensitive to those chemotherapy and they give them chemotherapy. What happened is that they really shorten their lifespan because they will suppress the immune system without doing much of impact on the cancer. And if they don't do the chemotherapy that, that, that they are not sensitive to, they may have even longer life if they leave the tumor by itself. Um, so that is the problem with chemo and radiotherapy in the mainstream medicine. And that's what the challenge is, is that cancer needs to be converted into personalized uh, treatment and not cutting, uh, you know, doing the same thing for all the patients and using the same regimen for all the patients. Um, you, there's a chance that the patient has it sensitive to that drug and they get improved, uh, but that's almost like less than 50%. And the other 50% if they fail, then really you sh what happened is that you shorten their lifespan with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, not, not just uh, as they, if they stay with the tumor, they may live longer. And you know, immunotherapy, when cancer therapy fails, they start them in immunotherapy. But about probably overall, considering all the patients given immunotherapy, only the 5% have have some prolongation of life more than they would have done without it. Oh yeah, and the reason yeah. why, and the reason why, because when you inject the immunotherapy and you shift the Tregs into DH1 uh, by blocking the CTLA, and so, you actually also inducing inflammation autoimmune to the healthy tissue. That's why they end up with a lot of colites and all the debilitating things. And that's because it's, it's, it's naked immunotherapy, the big pharma, and they are, it goes everywhere. I mean, it will be nice if they, if we go to silotherapeutic.com, uh, the platelet nanoparticle loaded, they are loading it with antibodies, with, with, with antibodies, you know. I think you may get better results. Now, Dr. Patel, because of the cost, it's just hard for her. Because those therapy, you need to have at least one year of what she does. And I believe most of the patients that come to you, they don't have the money to sustain one year of treatment because it will cost them almost $100,000 minimum per year, minimum. And then they could discontinue the treatment. So what will happen? They end up with relapse. During the treatment, they're good. Once you stop them from doing everything that you want to do because of the thing, of the money thing, they, they go back and they die fast. But do you know, when they are ready to, to tweet, I just say, okay, you're, you're, you, you know, this is, this is not, not possible for you. You can do, which is the, which is non-invasive. You take it orally and, and uh, maintain maintain the stage where you are. And there are, there are other protocols that we are using. Yeah, the, the, you know, the oral ones that you, know, you as Batlab Blue use, Ivermectin, um, you use all those. If, oral you, if you read, uh, there, is, there is an article out uh, just recently on Methylene Blue, and it, it, it discussed a lot of different good things about methylene blue, but when I, I looked in the methods, 
uh, found out that orally, oral given, when methylene blue is given orally, it, it is not as effective. I mean, they thought that it would be effective, but when they checked on the patient and the concentration, it was not effective. So if you want to give it, put it a large amount and give it twice a week, uh, to two to three days apart, then it works well. Otherwise, you think you are doing something, but it's not doing what you are, what you really want to see. I'm glad that I read the methods and other results. Then it was it was very evident. So, I mean, at least uh, it it helped me. Although we give twice a week, but some patients want just once a week. So. And they're very adamant about it. So you just do the best you can do. But what what dose constitutes a large amount? I, I, what I have found that most tolerated dose is 30 milligram. Mm -hmm. That's IV? That's IV? Yes, it is IV. And, and it has to be... Um, followed by some other IV treatment and then because you have to wait for about hour, hour and a half to get it concentrated into the tissue, uh, cancerous tumor, and then you do give the photodynamic treatment. Okay. Dr. Patel, because of the concern of tumor lysis and hemolysis, you just give them calcium gluconate for everybody? No, I, I think that, that what I, I figured it out that do not give, if you are giving chemo or if you are, if patient is new, you you don't give him, give him methylene blue on that time. Just, just start them with the uh, smaller dose of vitamin C, see how their body takes, build them up and then, then go from there. Because they are, if they have a debilitated malnourished body, they are not able to tolerate things. So what I build them up and then everybody. Is that some something that can be done? Like just to make sure to avoid any any, you know, just give them castle gluconite and then treat them as much as you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean I have used on a, on some patients like a, standard, a 20, standard, 20 ml of calcium gluconate. Yeah, can can we can say this calcium gluconate is just a prevention and needs to be given to all the patients with cancer. I think it is an intervention. It is inter acute intervention when they are having a reaction. Because if you don't do anything, you know you're going to lose the patient. You, can, you cannot say calcium gluconate prevention, giving it to everybody, or it's not affordable? Yeah, yeah. I have a calcium gluconate, and we, we, had, we had like 10 bottles ready. So whatever, it, that, that just means, uh, I think each bottle has a 10 ml. So we had uh, like 10, 10 bottles ready. And, and as soon as the patient come down and said, I'm feeling better, then we stopped that and, and kept patient for another two hours and was okay. So, I mean, I, I think you cannot run it with the paramedical. You, you have to be present to yourself because everything falls on your head. Well, well can, can we say, can we use it as a, as a basic? To everybody is using your treatment will have calcium gluconate prophylaxisly. Is that something? Yeah, yeah. I, I put calcium gluconate to start with in vitamin C. Okay. So I, I think Dr. Nario gave uh, gave a good um, approximation that if you are giving 10, 10 grams, you put one ml of calcium gluconate, and if you are giving a hundred, you put put 10, but don't, don't give a high amount of vitamin C on day one, because people are saying, oh, I went somewhere else and they gave me 50 ml, uh, 50, 50 grams, and you don't do that. You give, you start with 20, 25 grams, and then, uh, of course, you have to have a G6 speedy, don't do it without that. Usually for 15 grams, you don't have a problem, but when you keep on increasing, you will see the hemolysis. Then another thing that uh, I came across that for cancer patient, if patient is not diabetic, you give in 5% glucose, the vitamin C in 5% glucose, and you can give 
some insulin. So it becomes the insulin potentiated vitamin C treatment. Okay. okay. Any other comments, questions? Can I steal this doctor from you? And then you have Monday uh, for, you're gonna present in my group, Dr. William. So I'm announcing it in your group, right. in your group, if they wanna come to Dr. William Bill. Uh, he has a series of four parts and I'm gonna run it through uh, my Mondays. You're gonna do the part one next Monday. Um, I think it's gonna be excited. And, and then I will be doing the 19th of September, the ivermectin and pro probiotics. Uh, but um, possibly I talked to Dr. Klatz and he wants to do his group of on, on Friday and possibly we all go um, to his group on Friday just in, to, to maybe have the number that we want to, to, to put together a physical meeting. Because mm -hmm. if we three group, Farshan, you and I, and then there's another doctor uh, is gonna do Thursday, so we have four. And then all we invite them on Friday, we may end up with 100 attendees. And then we can go ahead and set up a physical meeting because now there's a piece, you know, there's a number to justify that. What do you think, Dr. William? Sounds okay to me. You need a night off to, you know, go dancing or something or play soccer, though. <laughs> right. So. He's talking about he's talking about Dr. Harshfield, Dr. Lewis, and Dr. Carter. They also have a Monday and Wednesday yeah. uh, Zoom too. They have a lot, quite a, usually sixty to ninety people show up on their thing. And so Dr. Harshfield was talking about Thursdays for you all bringing your hard patients. No, no, no. Thursday for him. Right, right. For Harshfield. And then Friday, all of the four groups will wow. go under Dr. Klatz. Okay. So okay. we can have the number, enough number, that if we get into 100 on Dr. Klatz, then you, right. we, we can all set up uh, a physical meeting. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to look into uh, around December 1st uh, here in Reno. Um, We'll look into that and we'll make it virtual too. So uh, you East Coast folks don't have to travel because I know John, John doesn't like to leave West Virginia. So, so, and you're muted, John, so I can't hear you. We'll be do, we'll do both virtual and all you hardworking guys on the West Coast. Okay, so just to let you know, next week we have Dr. Emmett Miller, who is apparently the father of body mind medicine. Um, some of you may have heard of him. Uh, he's very apparently very famous, um, and uh, he'll be uh, with us next week, uh, same time, same station. Um, Dr. Nario, thank you, great as always, and uh, we'll uh, pick your brain again shortly. So don't go too far. <laughs> um, John, you got anything else how, other than the, the feds are after you now? Uh, same old story. Okay. Anything from the medical school? They should be. Uh... Everything's positive with the school. Um, it's interesting that what our little group is doing is the kind of stuff they would like to present in the medical school, but they don't want to get fired or harassed or lose their license. So I think they're going to lean on us to bring up the weird stuff. Yeah, so what we've learned from Marlene Siegel, she's not here tonight, is that we should, should have all been veterinarians. That we could do what we wanted, you know, and they'd, they'd, they'd have left us alone, <laughs> so, right? So, uh, but that's that. Um, anybody else have anything? St Stefan, you got anything for us? You there? You're still, still on anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm here. No, no, nothing here. Nothing to report this week? No, nothing. Okay, great. Great job, Dr. Nario. Um, wait, wait, isn't your wedding coming up or did, did it did it already happen? Oh, yeah, that's this Friday, actually. Okay, all right, well. <laughs> uh, okay, well, congratulations and uh, uh, and uh, you know, best wishes. Um, Thanks. And Are we all invited now? Is that the Man, 
we'll do a party at A four M or something. How about that? There you go. Yes, that 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 makes sense. Yes. So one of go. the Friday in uh, Tau, or there's a uh, not far away from Tau, there is the Brazilian uh, steak, all you can eat, not oh. far away. Yeah, it's right. a good one. I I, I went there. Um, it's only eighty dollar per person, but you can eat all the meat you want. Yeah, they're good. I like those places. Right. So we can go there, right? Yeah, yeah. The next event we all go to, we'll go. I think John, um, I still I still think we should go to uh, Orlando and 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 rent a rent a, a, a place across the street from Omed and, and run our own. <laughs> so, yeah. I did I, I actually there. in Orlando last I did the five bedroom and and three or four bathroom and I invite my crew next to um, the um, conference. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do the same, you know. There's villas next to the place where they do the con congress. It's better than a hotel. Yeah. So well, yeah. I guess, well, we're looking at so Dr. Alasa. You were out here. We're looking at the pepper mill. You know, you've been here before. You've been there before. We did uh, our two live conferences out, out here there. So. And oh yeah, the one that you have the um, um, kind of a sketch of a uh, of a um, um, stage. What is the name? Of it? It's not the comedian. We did a we did a murder mystery. Yeah, the murder mystery one. Yeah, that was good. Are you going to do the same? I don't know yet. We're we're, we're just kicking the idea around here. Give me, we'll we'll have more information next next time. Okay, so. All right. We'll see. It's kind of a short notice. I don't even know if they have a, they'll have a, even have a room there. So we'll see. Um, uh, congratulations, Stefan from Dr. Nario. And yes, um, best wishes. And, and uh, you know, in our, as our people say, may you live to be at 20 and 100. So, <laughs> okay. So, although that's, but by the time that rolls around, that'll be a, a, a old fashioned, right, John? That's right. Okay, next week, Dr. Emmett Miller, um, same time, same station, uh, we will be here. Um, anybody else have any comments, questions? Um, anybody is interested in presenting anything at, uh, you know, in, in, in Reno, um, either live or, or virtually, let me know, um, and we'll, we'll get this together. All right. All right. Thanks, all right. All right. Good night, everybody. Uh, I'll get this uh, re uh, uh, online as soon as I can. Okay. See you next week. Thank you all for being here as always. And bring a friend.